Hey there, you're listening to the Sin Talks podcast, produced by the International Genetically Engineered Machine Team at the University of Toronto. I'm Adnan, one of the many hosts you will encounter in this podcast series. I'm one of the R&D leads for this year, and I'm currently going into my third year in a double major in cell and systems biology and just pure chemistry. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our second episode. Our goal is to educate you about synthetic biology and debunk the myths surrounding GMOs. We will interview professors and graduate students about their cutting-edge research projects and the ethical issues they face, their opinions about genetically modified organisms and their pathway to becoming experts in their respective fields. We hope you find these useful and enlightening. In last episode, we listened to Dr. Kathleen Heffron's research in plant virus expression systems and their uses in plant biologics. This episode, you will be listening to Dr. Jennifer Mitchell, who is also a professor here at the University of Toronto. Her team explores how the genome is folded and organized in the nucleus and how this organization influences regulation of gene expression. She was interviewed by Arjun Call a fourth-year student here at UFT studying neuroscience and cell and molecular biology. Here's their conversation. ...while discussing research with experts across different fields. I'm your host, Arjun Cole, and today we have with us Dr. Jennifer Mitchell, an associate professor at the Department of Cell and Systems Biology here at the University of Toronto. Her research focuses on investigating mechanisms that underlie tissue-specific regulation of gene expression and gene unfolding. Welcome, Dr. Mitchell. We're glad to have you on our podcast. Thank you for having me. So in the simplest terms, what's your research about? So my research is about figuring out how the human genome works to build specialized cells in our body. Every cell in our body has pretty much the same sequence of DNA, but different genes are turned on in different cell types so that they can do what they need to do. For example, nerve cells conduct electrical impulses, and red blood cells carry oxygen to our tissues. And these functions are possible because different genes are on or expressed in each context. Actually, the vast majority of the human genome does not code for genes, and it's what is called non-coding. In the past, this was referred to as junk DNA, but we now know that hiding in these non-coding parts of our genome are important instructions for when genes should turn on and off. And my research is about finding these instructions and figuring out how they work. We now use a new technique called CRISPR genome editing to better understand the human genome. This approach uses a bacterial protein called Cas9 that acts like a pair of molecular scissors to cut DNA at very precise locations in the genome. Using Cas9, we can change one or even hundreds of bases in a genome to study what role these bases have in gene regulation in cells or even in whole organisms. Okay, perfect. And um, so expanding on that a little bit, what are the real-life implications of your research? Right. So although some diseases are caused by differences in DNA that change a gene coding region, many diseases are actually caused uh, by changes in non-coding DNA that affect the on and off instructions for genes rather than the genes themselves. So the more we understand Uh, where these sequences are and how they work, the better we're able to understand why some people develop specific diseases and other people don't. We can also better design drugs to prevent the onset of the disease if we know more about what gene is not being properly turned on or off. So one example of this is diseases associated uh, with uh, red blood cells, specifically uh, diseases called thalassemia. So these diseases affect how the oxygen-carrying protein hemoglobin um, is expressed in our in red blood cells. And these are inherited uh, diseases, and some of them are due to missing pieces of those gene regulatory uh, regions. And so now that we know where those missing pieces of DNA are, we can um, identify families with this specific type of thalassemia, and we can generate new ways to treat the disease by providing the correct instructions to turn on uh, the globin genes in red blood cells. And what initially sparked your interest in the field, both within hematology and the wider field of synthetic biology, such stem cell biology? Right. So I was initially very interested in development and how one single cell can develop into an entire complex organism. And the more I learned about the complex process required inside our cells to allow them to develop these specialized functions, 
the more I wanted to figure out how one genome sequence could direct such a complex process. So I used to study how the beta globin gene is turned on and off in blood cells. And actually, people have been studying this um, for about 50 years, and we still don't have a complete understanding of what's happening to turn this gene on and off. So it's a really complex process. Um, now, at the University of Toronto, I study um, both embryonic and neural stem cells and how they maintain their specialized abilities to both self-renew to make more stem cells and also differentiate into multiple specialized cell types. So our podcast aims to educate the public about genetically modified organisms. What's your personal opinion about GMOs, at least what you think when you hear the word GMOs? Right. Well, that's a really big question, and I think it's one that's not really easy to give a universal answer to, but I'll do my best. Um, so when I think about GMOs in terms of sort of public understanding, I, I think about food GMOs mainly. And actually, essentially all the food we meet, eat is genetically modified in some way. And this occurred over several generations as farmers used selective breeding of animals and plants to select for better food yield or resistance to pests and diseases. But we don't often think about that process when we think about um, organisms being genetically modified. We think more about labor laboratory type processes. So one problem with the method of selective breeding is that sometimes the trait that you a trait that you don't want is genetically linked to a trait that you do want, and therefore you can't easily separate them. But now, using different approaches, we have ways to genetically modify organisms without selective breeding. For example, one, one way would be to use CRISPR genome editing. And so it's my opinion that with proper regulation, uh, GMO foods are just as safe as any other food. And the difference is that when we're actually designing something through a genome editing approach, we can specifically target the genes that we know are associated with the traits that we want in our foods. Um, and so we can better design our uh, crops to be drought resistant. Um, and this improves the use of our land and it prevents overuse of pesticides and at the same time produces more food. And so I think this is really important because as we know, climate change is occurring and this is a problem with uh, food security. And it's really important that our food sources are able to grow in a wide variety of conditions. And so I anticipate that genome engineering is going to help us ensure that we're able to grow food in a changing climate while we continue to work towards stabilizing the climate of our planet. So um, there are probably many students out there aspiring to do research uh, like yourself or like the research that you're doing. What's your advice to those students? So um, students often, especially first-year students, um, ask me that. And so what I tell them is that they should be thinking deeply about what interests them most as they take different courses during their degree, and that they should try to seek out research and other experiential learning opportunities in those areas. I encourage them to try different things and to talk to people with the careers they're interested in to find out what the job is really like. What I like most about what I do is that it's problem solving based and that my research is driven by my curiosity and the curiosity of students in my lab. When we discover something new, we get to share it with the rest of the scientific community to advance our collective knowledge and that's really exciting. And in my career, I'm committed to always learning new things and I really enjoy the interactions that I have with other students at all levels. And actually, we're all still students of biology, even when we're professors and that keeps the work really exciting. Perfect. Um, all right, that should conclude. That concludes our second episode. To learn more about our team and projects, you can visit our website at igymtoronto.ca or check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Stay tuned for our next episode to learn more about exciting research projects in synthetic biology. Till then, this is Adnan signing off from the Synthogs Podcast. <laughs>